What a thrilling life awaits you. The acquisition of knowledge is a sacred activity. A truly educated man never ceases to learn. The future is in your hands. The outcome is up to you. This BYU devotional address with Elder Glenn L. Pace was given on March 9, 2010. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to our devotional. We are pleased to have as our speaker today Elder Glenn L. Pace, a member of the Seventy. We especially welcome Sister Pace, who is seated on the stand, as well as family members and friends who have joined us. Elder Pace was called as a general authority in April of 1985 to serve as second counselor in the presiding bishopric, a position he held until his call to the Seventy in October of 1992. He has served as President of the North America Northwest Area, as President of the Africa West Area, and as President of the North America Northeast Area. He is currently serving as Chairman of the Church Audit Committee. Elder Pace worked in the Welfare Services Department of the Church for nine years, which included four years as Managing Director of that department. He received his accountant, Master of Accountancy degree from Brigham Young University and worked for an international accounting firm for several years. He served as a full-time missionary in the New England States Mission and as Mission President of the Australia-Sydney North Mission. Elder Pace and his wife Jolene Clayson Pace are both from Provo, Utah. They are parents of six and have 29 grandchildren. And now our good friend Elder Pace. Thank you, President Samuelson. The family, a proclamation to the world, states, All human beings, male and female, are created in the image of God. Each is a beloved spirit son or daughter of heavenly parents, and as such, each has a divine nature and destiny. Gender is an essential characteristic of individual premortal, mortal, and eternal identity and purpose. My focus this morning will be on the divine nature and destiny of women and the sacred role they play in the sanctification and purification of men. I'm going to start by giving you two exclusive scoops. First, males and females are different. And second, those differences are more than physical. I developed a love and appreciation for womanhood in my childhood. My mothers, sisters, grandmas, aunts, and female cousins and friends brought immeasurable love into my young life. This set the stage for the adult relationships with my wife, daughters, and granddaughters. All of the above have contributed to my feelings of reverence, adoration, and even veneration for righteous women. In pondering the effect women have had on my life, I have concluded that there has been a metamorphosis of my spirit which could not have taken place without these relationships. Of course, the first woman in my life was my mother. How can I describe the impact of my mother's love? A lullaby, being tucked in bed, are you warm enough? A kiss goodnight, Glenn, you'd better get up, you don't want to be late for school. A kiss good morning, you are such a special boy, how I love you. I made some chocolate chip cookies, I want to take your picture. I'm so proud of you. I know you can do it. Are you going to go on a mission? You are going to go on a mission. <laughs> I miss you so much. Frequent love notes. Let's go look at the roses. Did you see the full moon? Aren't the mountains beautiful today? The love in her eyes, her touch, her smell her elegance, her tender heart, her sensitivity, her femininity. That was just a blink 
in a lifetime of nurturing. In addition to the loving care I received from my mother, I received similar nurturing from my big sister, who was my mentor and protector. When I was old enough to enter kindergarten, I was worried sick. I'd watched my sister do her homework and was concerned by the fact that I didn't know how to read or do arithmetic. The night before school started, my apprehension must have shown because she came into the bedroom and started talking to me about school. I explained my concerns, and she immediately began to allay my fears. She told me about recess. I could handle that. <laughs> then she explained that I would be taught to read one word at a time, and she assured me that I was smart and wouldn't have any trouble. Now, how would a brother have handled that situation? <laughs> What's the matter with you? Oh, is Glenny going to cry? <laughs> and so I explain, I'm never going to graduate from kindergarten because I don't know how to read or do my arithmetic. He would then say, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. If you'll give me your allowance, I'll help you. <laughs> now, how would a brother handle a situation like that? Different than a sister. As I mentioned earlier, men and women are different. My appreciation for women rose to a whole new dimension when our two daughters came into our lives. There is something angelic about daughters, at least in the eyes of their father. I have sometimes lamented that I wasn't born with the perspective that daughters brought into my life. If a man could be born with that insight, he would, his respect for and treatment of a young woman during his dating years would improve significantly. I remember a time when my oldest daughter was just six or seven years old. I was struggling with saying my personal prayers on a consistent basis. I remember walking into her bedroom one night to listen to her say her prayers. Her room felt so peaceful, innocent, and pure that I felt like praying. I explained as best I could that I had been having a hard time staying in the habit of saying my prayers and asked if I could pray at her bedside. She looked a little puzzled but agreed. On the second or third night, as I began my silent prayer, I felt her little hand on my head. She then turned on her side and with both hands began running her fingers through my hair. I must admit, I felt I had been touched by an angel, and also my prayers became longer because it felt so good. <laughs> to this day, whenever there is a family gathering, I will eventually work my way over to the couch or chair where she is sitting, and I will sit on the floor and wait for her to run her fingers through my hair. From the time my second daughter was a baby through her early grade school years, I would rock her to sleep at night and carry her to bed. I always knew when she was asleep because tiny beads of perspiration would appear on her little nose. I would look at her angelic face and wonder if heaven could be any better than this. I concluded it must be a great comfort to her to fall asleep in her father's arms. Now I realize the peace and comfort she transmitted to me was possibly even greater. I've always been impressed with the love and respect our Savior bestowed upon the women in His life. As we read about these associations, our focus is generally on what He teaches them and the love and understanding He gives them. Have you ever considered the possibility that these women provided immense comfort to his burdened soul? It is my belief that he needed them as he journeyed toward living a perfect life in order that he could provide the ultimate sacrifice. 
I repeat that my association and interplay with the righteous women in my life has created a metamorphosis of my spirit and has been a purifying and sanctifying experience. I'd now like to turn to the more intimate relationship of husband and wife and the impact that relationship has on our exaltation. You're all familiar with the story of the creation. I'm going to pick up the account where Adam was placed on the earth. Please pay particular attention to the sequence of events leading up to the introduction of Eve. And the gods formed man from the dust of the ground and took his spirit, that is the man's spirit, and put it into him and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the gods planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there they put the man whose spirit they had put into the body which they had formed. And out of the ground made the gods to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Thus far, there is no mention of Eve. And out of the ground I, the Lord God, formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and commanded that they should come unto Adam to see what he would call them. And they were also living souls, for I, God, breathed into them the breath of life, and commanded that whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that should be the name thereof. Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But as for Adam, there was not found an helpmeet for him. In summary, before Eve appeared, the world was created. Adam had been placed in the Garden of Eden, and he had named and associated with all of the animals. He was enjoying a utopia in physical surroundings, as well as open communication with God. What more could he ask for? What more could he need? As President J. Reuben Clark says, Adam wandered alone in the glorious garden in Eden, which he had dressed and adorned. The Garden of Eden with its stately trees, its lovely flowers heavy with sweet odors, its grassy swords, its magnificent vistas with the far reaches of its placid rivers, with its gaily plumed birds, its lordly and graceful beasts, all at peace, for sin was not yet in the world. Through all this magnificence, Adam wandered lonely, unsolaced, uncompanioned, the only being in, of his kind in the whole world, his life unshared in a solitude of exquisite elegance. And what was a far greater moment, his mission as he knew it to be impossible of fulfillment except the Father gave him and help meet." Close quote. I'd like to share a perspective from John Milton's Paradise Lost, which fully resonates with my soul. Much like President Clark, Milton describes the beauty of the garden and the variety of animals. However, he goes into more detail on his perception of Adam's frustration and loneliness. In his account, Adam watches the interplay between the animals and communicates with them as best he can. However, Adam concludes something is drastically amiss. Milton writes, They rejoice, each with their kind, lion and lioness, so fitly them in pairs thou hast combined. Much less can bird with beast or fish with fowl so well converse, nor with the ox, the ape. Worse then can man with beast, and least of all. In other words, Adam is saying, what's wrong with this picture? Milton goes on to suggest that God delayed the introduction of Eve until Adam could fully appreciate her. Seeing that Adam is now ready for the introduction of Eve, God describes what is going to happen next. I love Milton's description of what Eve would mean to Adam. 
What next I bring shall please thee, be assured. Thy likeness, thy fit help, thy other self, thy wish exactly to thy heart's desire. Thy fit help? No, this doesn't mean she would be in good shape. It means she would be a match, a complement, a counterpart, even his other self. Finally, Eve stood before him, and she exceeded his highest expectations. He had never seen anything like her in the garden. Milton continues, Under his forming hands a creature grew, man-like but different sex, so lovely fair that what seemed fair in all the world seemed now mean or in her summed up, in her contained, and in her looks, which from that time infused sweetness into my heart, unfelt before. I hope Milton will forgive me for adding my opinion that the sweetness Adam felt, which was unfelt before, was much more than that which was generated by Eve's physical appearance. Those feelings flowing into him had as their source her wellspring. His feelings were the direct result of standing in front of one of the daughters of heavenly parents who had a divine nature different from but complementary to his own divine nature. I believe the Father's statement, it is not good that the man should be alone, had a much more profound meaning than the obvious biological implications. It also went further than providing Adam with company. Adam's ability to obtain the purification necessary to get back into the presence of God was dependent upon his continuous association with Eve. Remember what Adam said when Eve stood before him for the first time, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Many years after the creation of Adam and Eve, Paul said, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the Lord, uh, without the man in the Lord. Yeah, and in the Doctrine and Covenants, in the celestial glory there are three heavens or degrees, and in order to obtain the highest, and man must enter into this order of the priesthood, meaning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. And if he does not, he cannot obtain it. Why can't he obtain it? It's not just because he didn't obey a celestial commandment. It's because he didn't become a celestial being. There is a limit to our spiritual development as long as we are single. There is a spiritual development which can only be obtained when a man and a woman join their incomplete selves into a complete couple. Just as conception requires the physical union of male and female, perfection requires the union of the very souls of male and female. Elder Richard G. Scott has said, In the Lord's plan it takes two, a man and a woman, to form a whole. Indeed, a husband and wife are not two identical halves, but a wondrous, divinely determined combination of complementary capacities and characteristics." Close quote. Men and women can accomplish marvelous things alone. However, they are incomplete until united intellectually, emotionally, physically, and most importantly, spiritually. The world we live in has gone awry with its focus on the physical part of the male and female relationship. If there is too much focus on the physical, the vital areas of intellectual, emotional, and spiritual union are not being placed in an environment where they can flourish and grow. Our current society is so obsessed with making love they are not developing a complete relationship which would enable, would enable them to express love. 
since melding our divine natures is a necessary element in bringing about perfection. We must guard against any deterioration of those natures. Sisters, keep in mind anything that detracts from your divine nature should be avoided. You live in a time when you have more opportunities and options available to you than any other women have had throughout the history of mankind. Some of these options will complement your God-given natures. Others will chip away at it. Some things will make you strong. Others will make you hard. Some will increase your spiritual sensitivity. Others will separate you from the Spirit. If the world keeps chipping away at the divine nature of women, it is probable that our relationships in marriage will not bring about the sanctification necessary for exaltation, or, as a minimum, the process will be delayed. I would now like to express my love and appreciation to my wife. She is an example of one who has retained her eternal nature through 47 years of marriage, six children, 29 grandchildren, and putting up with me. Wearing that eternal nature well, she has supported me as a general authority for 25 years. I could not have served, nor would I have been qualified to serve, without her love and support. She has been the crucial key to the metamorphosis I desperately needed to become worthy and able to serve. Her eternal nature and destiny was never clearer to me than at the temple marriage of our youngest son. I have had the sacred honor of performing the marriages of all six of our children, and they, along with their spouses, were worthy to be in attendance on that occasion. Prior to the ceremony, as I spoke of sacred things, I looked at my wife, who was seated next to our son. My spiritual eyes were opened, and I saw her shining in all of her glory as she basked in the warmth of having joy and rejoicing in her posterity. She was radiant. I saw before me a priestess, queen, and goddess. There is absolutely nothing the world can offer which could come close to the fulfillment she was feeling. There was no accomplishment in the world she could have attained which would have made me love her more or be more proud of her efforts. Her eternal nature was then and is now still intact. We commonly hear the phrase, men have the priesthood and women have been given the blessing of procreation. Neither assignment meets the measure of its creation unless there is perfection. After perfection comes the ultimate role of God and Goddess. These are eternal roles where one continues to complement the other throughout all eternity. It is in the marriage ceremony in the temple where husband and wife receive the power to perfect their relationship and thereby obtain exaltation. As Elder John A. Witzel put it, Modern revelation sets forth the high destiny of those who are sealed for everlasting companionship. They will be given opportunity for a greater use of their powers. That means progress. They will attain more readily to their place in the presence of the Lord. They will increase more rapidly in every divine power. They will approach more nearly to the likeness of God they will more completely realize their divine destiny. And this progress is not delayed until life after death. It begins here today for those who yield obedience to the law. I emphasize that the power coming down from heaven in those, for, to those married in the temple by the holy priesthood cannot alone bring about the progress mentioned by Elder Witzel. It takes the interplay of male and female. I like the Quaker proverb, Thee lift me, and I'll lift thee, and we'll both ascend together. 
what will happen when we, are, when we finally ascend together. I cannot put it any better than one of the great women in our history, Eliza R. Snow, who said, when I leave this frail existence, when I lay this mortal by, father, mother, may I meet you in your royal courts on high. Then at length, when I've completed all you sent me forth to do, with your mutual approbation, let me come and dwell with you. Sisters, I testify that when you stand in front of your heavenly parents in those royal courts on high, and you look into her eyes and behold her countenance, any question you ever had about the role of women in the kingdom will evaporate into the rich celestial air. Because at that moment, you will see standing directly in front of you your divine nature and destiny. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This BYU devotional address with Elder Glenn L. Pace was given on March 9, 2010.